Okay, so welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Dr. Scott Didums. Scott's a, um, he's a leader, I guess, of the group of optical frequency measurements uh, at NIST in Boulder, Colorado. And it's a real pleasure to have him here. Um, I've known Scott for quite a while. He goes back to uh, his PhD days at the University of New Mexico. Um, graduated from there in 1996, I guess. Um, and I happened to uh, inherit the lab from Scott after that, so I've known him for a while. Um, from 1996 through 2000, he did his postdoc work at JILA, uh, which is a joint institute, many of you know, at, at NIST and the University of Colorado. And he did his work with Jan Hall. And uh, I'll just say that before he went to, to JILA, there was no such thing as an optical frequency comb. <laughs> and when he left, it, it was dramatically changing the landscape of optical frequency metrology. And um, he basically was, uh, he and his colleagues, while he was at JILA, developed what we really utilized as a powerful tool today in the optical frequency comb. <laughs> Um, and he continued on, uh, then on to NIST, uh, where he's been since 2000, I guess. So he's been there quite a while. And, you know, he's really pioneered uh, the field with optical frequency combs and used them, of course, as a basis for um, atomic clocks based on optical transitions, as well as novel spectroscopies. And uh, he's probably built just about every uh, type of frequency comb out there over the years, I think. Um, and more recently, he's been working on microresonator frequency combs. And uh, he'll be telling us a little bit about some of that work today. So, Scott, Great. thanks for coming out. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. <laughs> thanks for the kind introduction, and yeah, thank you all for the opportunity to be here and tell you a little bit about the work that I do in Boulder. And so I, I chose for the title uh, Synthesizing Light, and maybe some might come here thinking they're going to learn about biology or chemistry, but the type of synthesis I'm talking about is, is more of an electrical engineering or really um, maybe it even touches on mechanical engineering, but um, how you would take light and rigorously count or create, make, and count the, the cycles of light, uh, much like you would do with mechanical gears that would make up clocks. So that's kind of the gist of the story today. Um, but to get going, I just wanted to start at a very basic level and, and try to put us all on the same page by asking what is a frequency synthesizer, okay? So it's, it's kind of a specific definition, but it's pretty important in, in that if you have an input frequency and you're going to get an output frequency from some synthesizer, all you're doing is taking the, the input and multiplying by the ratio of, of two integers. And you might that's not a very complicated formula, and in fact, you all experience this if you ride a bike, is it's just the same formula that um, defines this kind of synthesis. If the pedals rotate one time, then the back wheel rotates n over m times, where this is the gear ratio, okay? So that's what I mean by synthesis, and the coherence piece means that we can rigorously connect, you know, input cycles or input ticks to output ticks. So how, how might this work for light? Well, could we imagine a box, and it's a black box, that has some frequency ratio n over m that's about 5 times 10 to the 7. In that case, if you took 10 megahertz in, you would get optical light out, 500, megahertz, 500 terahertz in that case. But maybe we want to be a little more specific. You know, what if we wanted to have 1 point 064 blah 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 times 10 to the 8 is our multiplier there. And in that case, could we get out, you know, 1 petahertz, 64 terahertz, 721 gigahertz, 609 megahertz, 899 kilohertz, 143 exactly hertz? Could you make something that could do that? Or if you turned it around, could you put this in, you know, let's pedal the wheels backwards. Could we put this in and get, again, 10 megahertz out? I think that would be a pretty remarkable device if we could do that. It would be a disruptive kind of advance for the control of the optical spectrum. It would allow us to do in the optical domain what you can buy from analog devices, uh, you know, packaged up little chip that allows you to do that in the electrical domain. And it, I think it would be analogous, or it is analogous to the microwave developments that began in the 1940s, you know, m motivated by people trying to figure out how to do radio communications and radars. People started building up technologies that allowed them to control 
radio frequencies and microwave frequencies with great agility. And that, that impacted, you know, practically everything around us, communication systems, radar and sensing and navigation systems, you know, down to spectroscopy and basic science. So how could you do this with light, right? And that, that's a bit the, the story I'm going to tell you about today in the introduction and then give you a few examples of how we're actually implementing that and some of the, the things that it allows us to do types of measurements and, um, and applications. So the answer is one that probably, you know, now, as, as Jason mentioned, I'm getting old. It's, it's um, you know, 18 years ago or so, 20 years ago, actually, we, we made a first device like this with a mode locked laser. And that uh, was this light synthesizer. It's an optical frequency comb. And I, the, just like the Janus, the, the god who is looking both forward and backward at the same time, frequency combs kind of have two sides to them. So you have to look in the time domain and the frequency domain to get the, the full picture of them. In the frequency domain, a comb is, is just like the words imply. It's, a, it's an array of optical frequencies uh, defined by two parameters, the, the spacing between the modes and some offset, of a common offset of all the modes. And in fact, this, this is now my synthesizer equation where I can take I get an optical frequency, the frequency of one of those modes is just the spacing of the modes times what's in parentheses here, that's just my ratio of two integers, in fact, as I defined it in the earlier slide. In the time domain, the Fourier transform tells us what this looks like, and, and that's just a series of ultra-short pulses that would come from a laser, a mode lock laser that would make such a, a comb of frequencies. And here we see that, that the, the ratio of the offset and the repetition rate, or the mode spacing, is related to the advancing of the carrier with respect to the envelope in the time domain um, with each subsequent pulse. So that, that brings about some interesting kind of opportunities, not only that we'd have high spectral resolution, but we have short pulses and high peak power, and in fact, this is kind of a key advance not only for things like synthesizing light, but actually controlling uh, the cycles of light, um, the carrier here with respect to the envelope. So that, that opens up new opportunities in high intensity laser physics. So that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts picture in the time and frequency domains. Oh, and actually, yeah, that was a pretty nice idea. Jan Hall and Ted Hench were awarded a Nobel Prize 2005 for, in part, for this kind of work. Maybe another picture you could have, a very simple one, is, is the mechanical one I mentioned at the beginning, is that a frequency comb just functions like gears. And again, I want to emphasize, and it's a subtle point, but a very important one, that, that those gears, it's the exact enmeshing, and if you want to think of this as an optical frequency, and each little tooth on there is a cycle of light, it's the ability to perfectly enmesh that light gear with that optical oscillation to say divide it down to get a microwave frequency at the, at the, if you wanted to run it backwards or running it forwards to go from microwave to optical domain. That's really the coherence that optical frequency combs provide. And in, in the frequency domain this allows us, this is kind of the picture you would have, it, looks, it already looks a little bit like a clock, a clockwork. It allows us to control optical frequencies with RF agility and maturity. So we could do things on this side and have them show up according to that equation I, I showed you early on the previous page with kind of the agility or the, 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 all the tools we have in the microwave domain, we can try and transfer those to the optical domain. That allows us to synthesize optical waveforms. It's kind of a key to what we call now attosecond timekeeping. I won't say a lot of that, but this is the basic clockwork that we use for the best clocks now that are keeping time with about 18 digits of precision. These are optical clocks. It also allows us to, to generate, uh, you know, not just from microwave to optical, but actually any frequency in between, millimeter waves, uh, terahertz waves with optical precision. And by optical precision, I mean the precision that comes from knowing the exact optical cycle, where an optical cycle is, is roughly a femtosecond. So we can build in that kind of precision to this, this, or that type of precision is built into this 
tool. Okay, with, with that brief introduction on what optical frequency combs are, I'm going to give two examples, and um, that will be the bulk of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about a, a new type of frequency comb that is very different than the mode lock laser I alluded to that, that first gave a rise to frequency combs in the, in the late 1990s. And this is allowing us to do, for the first time, uh, optical frequency synthesis on a chip. So maybe the first, uh, you know, the idea that, well, maybe we could, we could do with optics what you can buy from analog devices. Now the first pieces are starting to come together that allow you to see how that might work. And then the other topic I want to discuss is, is what I call synthesizing new colors for spectroscopy. And in particular, there's an interesting thing that happened in laser physics is that, you know, the first laser that was made was a visible laser, okay? And for many years, lasers by and large occupied the visible near-infrared portion of the spectrum. In fact, the most developed lasers are, are ones probably used in telecom s systems, 1.5 micron or famous lasers like one micron lasers. There's this, this whole block of the electromagnetic spectrum the infrared and the terahertz region that's largely been left untouched. Of course, there, there are some famous examples there where people have laser light or CO2 lasers, for example, in that region. But it's, it, it, for spectroscopy and for some types of sensing, um, for bioimaging, for different applications that I'll tell you a little bit about, it, it's a very interesting region of the spectrum. So we're starting to develop tools that would allow us to do and do experiments with, with uh, light that we synthesize in that region. So let me first tell you a little bit about microwave or microresonator frequency combs and motivate that, you know, kind of with a, a bit of a historical picture. If, if you were to come to a place like NIST back in the, the 1970s or 80s, people knew that, that optics were a great thing. And there was a lot of promise for it. In fact, people wanted to make optical clocks, but there was no way to count, count optical cycles. So brave people, you know, Jan Hall included, I think that's a gentleman in the back, is Ken Evenson built these things called frequency chains that were kind of Rube Goldberg almost like experiments that would be, try to connect the microwave to the optical domain. That, that filled a lab, you know, kind of 100 meters squared. In, around 2000, with the, the work, the early work there, we could reduce that down to kind of tabletop. And this is a picture of one of our first titanium sapphire laser frequency combs. Developments that we're now working on are allowing us to, to drop this down, you know, to where maybe it's just going to be a centimeter squared on a chip in future versions. And, and this is really going to take the power of photonic integrated circuits. This whole growing field, you know, sometimes people call that silicon photonics, but it's, it's much broader even than silicon. But it's allowing us to really route and control and use light on a chip much like uh, microelectronics. So that, that, you know, this is a picture I took the, from analog devices. You know, could we one day have a little chip, a centimeter square package, um, that would allow us to do optical synthesis, but digitally and controlled on a chip. And what I'm going to tell you about are some of the first experiments that are putting us on that path. Those experiments all inv involve microresonators. And this is kind of a new way of making optical frequency combs that relies on chi-3 nonlinearity, the Kerr nonlinearity, and high-Q microresonators. And here, this is a picture that, that Kerry Vahala, a collaborator at Caltech, gave me and just kind of a, a, a bit of a, a, a zoo of all the different types of microresonators people are, are developing, working with. So there's a lot of interesting platforms and interesting materials. Some of the properties they all share is that they, they confine the light tightly so that, that nonlinear optics starts to work at low average powers, milliwatts or even microwatts of power. And they also um, store the light a long time. So in a tiny little ring that might just be 40 microns across, you can store the photons in there a long time. So you get effectively long interaction times. This brought about what I like to call a tiny revolution in frequency combs. And it's based on the, the chi-3, the well-known four-wave mixing. So if you were able to couple continuous wave light, so this is meant to be a frequency axis here, 
you couple a little bit of it evanescently, say, into one of these cavities that circulates around. And first, starting with degenerate four-wave mixing, two of the input photons um, parametrically then down convert to, well, I got my arrows backwards there. We got um, a, a photon one of higher and lower frequency, okay? So that would be our first side bands in this comb, and then this, proce this process can cascade and give you um, multiple combs. And in fact, in 2011, with um, Tobias Kippenberg and Ronald Holtzwarth, we wrote a, a review article, and the field was just emerging. These are a few pictures from that field, or from that article. And at that time, you could start to make these wonderful-looking combs. And in fact, because the devices are small, that makes the mode spacing between the teeth big. And so you could even, for the first time, very easily see comb lines as, as are shown in these optical spectra. And these are examples from different labs and making combs at different repetition rates. But at that time, the interesting thing was those were beautiful to look at on pictures like that, but they were completely useless. And the reason they were useless is we didn't really understand not fully the physics. Okay, we knew four-wave mixing was involved, but we didn't really understand how it was operating and how to control it to make these combs really make useful low-noise devices or low-noise frequency combs. So even though they maybe appeared regularly spaced, um, these were noisy devices or noisy combs that we really couldn't do this type of synthesis that I talked about. That required a, a, a more thorough digging in to the nonlinear optics be, behind microcomb formation. And in this slide, I'll, I'll attempt to give you just a little bit of a flavor of that, what goes on. So, so the, the idea of making a, a comb out of a microresonator all relies on the fact that in, in a resonator, all types of resonators, you have resonant modes. Okay? And, and we want to couple a little bit of light into one of those resonances. And in that case, the intensity, the power inside the cavity builds up, and then this nonlinear optics can start to take place. You can have the four-wave mixing. Well, it's a Kerr effect, right? And so most of you would recognize that there's going to be a phase shift once you start to get significant in intensity inside this cavity. So what you might have thought should have been a Lorentzian-like looking resonance actually gets tilted. And that's because as, the, as you put more power in the cavity, you get more phase shift and the resonant runs away from you. Okay? So this makes for some interesting um, operational challenges as well as it's really the core to the physics that, that allows us to ultimately make solitons in these devices. So if, if one brings your laser from um, this side, and this would be the, the blue side of the resonance, as I've, I, I don't know if I've drawn it quite that way, but trust me, it's the blue side. You tune the laser in, coming up the branch here, you start to get, you know, first parametric oscillation. That's this four-wave mixing. You can get kind of clumpy-like looking combs, but then actually if you, if you stay on this side, it turns out, and I won't go into all the details, you get these things that look like, I mean, if you could look in here, there really are apparent comb teeth, but these are called chaotic combs. And those were the ones that we've, people were first seeing, I showed in the previous slide, that are interesting but not very useful. But what one has to do is come off of this upper branch and get on the lower branch, and there's some technical gymnastics, not just related to the Kerr effect, but related to thermal nonlinearities in the resonators that makes that a little challenging. But that's been something that's been solved in just the past three or four years. And once one can get there, you can get these beautiful soliton um, frequency combs that exist on this side of the resonance. Okay? And, and in the frequency domain, that would have a hyperbolic secant-like envelope and you know underneath here would be all the teeth one tooth is bigger that's your original pump laser okay in the time domain what you have going around the cavity is a soliton that's kind of surfing on the the CW background that's the the original pump laser we can describe these solitons as you might expect by a type of a nonlinear Schrodinger equation this one's called the Lugiato Lefebvre equation and it has a lot of the ingredients you would rec recognize from a nonlinear Schrodinger type equation with a few extra additions. First of all, there's the Kerr nonlinearity. So psi is just the, the field in the cavity. You have the Kerr nonlinearity. 
you have a term that's the, the second order dispersion, but the things that are a little different is you have a, a constant source field, okay, this is the CW pump light, and then you have a detuning in here along with loss. So it's, it's really the combination of the detuning and the pumping that make these kind of interesting are different from, um, you know, more typical solitons that you might know from nonlinear fiber optics. So with, with, with that toolbox or with that little brief description, I want to tell you about some devices and um, approaches we're using with these solitons to put them together to make the, the building blocks of a chip scale optical frequency synthesizer. So this is a big project that, that at NIST we're a part of. It's a, a project that was funded by DARPA. It's called the DARPA DODOS project. Don't ask me, you know, the, the guy who started it. You know DARPA, they, they must have a whole department that thinks up these acronyms. But anyway, um, it's really, yes, the DODOS bird, but direct on-chip digital optical synthesizer is what DODOS stands for. And our, our, the, the PI is John Bowers at UC Santa Barbara. Many of you know that, and there's, you know, our team at NIST and Caltech, EPFL in Switzerland, University of Virginia, and a company, Arion, which is now owned by Juniper Networks. So, um, so it's a big group of people and been a really fun interaction. And so what I'm talking about is really representative of the effort of many people. So here, here's the idea for how we're going to use these micro-resonators to make an optical frequency synthesizer, Okay. And, and maybe it's easiest to first start on this side. We're going to actually make, um, if you want to think about it that way, is a, a, a gear that has two gears, okay? So it's kind of a, a dual reduction gear or a dual multiplication gear. We're going to build one comb that has a very broad spacing, a terahertz comb, and we, we figured out how to make this comb very broad in spectrum. And I, I didn't discuss it earlier, but we need to have spectra that in fact span an octave to be able to easily measure this offset frequency. Well, terahertz is, is a pretty high frequency. You can't easily measure a terahertz. So we're going to use a second comb that's maybe about 15 gigahertz or 15, 20 gigahertz that kind of fits in between and measures the spacing of that terahertz comb. And then the output of our synthesizer is going to be a tunable laser that could be referenced, this 15 gigahertz comb is just going to be like a ruler, an optical ruler, and we can tick this output CW laser along anywhere relative to one of those ticks. So, so in the, again, in the gear picture, we've kind of enmeshed a gear that takes us from, this, this first comb is going to take us from 200 terahertz down to a terahertz. This one's going to take us from a terahertz to 15 gigahertz where we can measure, and that has this optical backbone against which we can tune this laser. This schematically shows the, the three components, a little bit of the math. These are what the devices look like. So we, we have a, a terahertz microresonator based on silicon nitride. We have uh, 15 gigahertz silicon dioxide resonators. And then this is a chip tunable laser that is the, the out, output of this synthesizer. So let me tell you a little bit how these pieces go together and show you a little bit of the operating kind of spectra we get out of them. So this terahertz resonator is just um, about 40 microns across. And what you're looking at is a ridge if you, of silicon nitride. And there's these kind of, we call them bus waveguides. Light would come in here, would, a little bit would couple into the resonator. We have one place here we can couple out a little bit of light. This type of comb, when we make solitons out of it, have this spectacularly broad spectrum. And this, in fact, is a single soliton circulating inside this cavity. And it has these, this typical or characteristic hyperbolic secant-like structure and some little bat ears here in the wings that actually turn out to be really handy. And those, those are the result of um, dispersive phase matching, where we start to come out of phase matching, the process is a little less efficient, but then there's some, we can engineer the dispersion so that the phase matching peaks up again to, um, to optimize the power in the wings here. And if we're good, we can put those at exactly an octave separation, and that allows us to do this critical step 
that, that allows us to measure the offset frequency of that comb. That is, what's the global shift of that comb? The really interesting thing about this is this, and in fact, this is why we designed it this way, is this operates with average powers of, of well under 100 milliwatts. In fact, down to, you know, um, as low, we've seen as low as about 25, 30 milliwatts to make combs like that. And that means that it's kind of consistent with, you know, on-chip diode lasers. So thinking again to the future where you could package something like this together with a uh, diode laser, that's, it's, it's really a feasible solution. I also mentioned that this Lugiato Lefebvre equation, as you can see, it, it well describes what we actually see in the experiment. So we really have the tools to, to not only, you know, model these, but then take the model to describe the fabrication, the parameters of the fabrication, and build the devices that we hope and, and in, in the end prove actually make these kind of spectra. There's kind of a picture of the, the cross-section of that silicon nitride waveguide. Okay, and, and one of the interesting things that we can play with is not only the thickness, the width of that, um, of that rectangular-like waveguide, and that allows us to vary the position, for example, of these, we call them dispersive waves in the wings. It also allows us, if we, so that's varying the width here, W, if we vary the radius, we can actually shift the entire comb. So these are different devices and we can make this offset frequency, in fact, something that's close to a measurable frequency. The, so that, that's this underlying terahertz comb that, that connects the optical down to one terahertz. The, the second piece or the second comb in that device is, is one of these high Q uh, silica microresonators that comes from Kerry Vahala's group at Caltech. And um, what you're looking at here is something that if you wanted to envision it like a Frisbee, okay, or a, a platter, a dish from your cabinet that's lifted, it's made of silica and it's lifted up off a silicon surface just by a few tens of microns. But the, the light then gets trapped in the periphery right around the edge of this dish. And the cues in these devices can be up to about a billion. And even more remarkable is, you know, Kerry has now figured out how to integrate those fully so that this is now a silicon nitride waveguide, not some sort of a tapered optical fiber, but they're, they're a fully integrated type platform. And you can do that while maintaining the high Q. On the right here, you just see some of the different soliton spectra we can get you know, at, at different center pump wavelengths. The, the final piece is the one that comes from, from Bauer's group at Santa Barbara and then this company, Orion. And that's a, that's a, um, a, a 3.5 quantum well laser that's integrated on a silicon platform. Okay, and, and honestly, I don't know a lot about that laser. I didn't build that, but I could give you the analogy of how I think about it. Is that's kind of like, uh, you know, go to, well, it used to be New Focus, now it's Newport, or go to Toptica and buy an extended cavity diode laser, okay, and put one of those on a chip. So this kind of has 100 kilohertz line width, um, 50 milliwatts, 10 to, to 20, 50 milliwatts output power, okay? And it's tunable across the entire C-band, you know? So it's, it's like a tunable ECDL on a chip. So a pretty fabri fabulous thing. So this is what it looks like when we put the pieces together. So remember the picture of the terahertz being the backbone, the, the, the silicon dioxide, comb, filling in those gaps, and then the laser, the CW laser tuning across reference to those comb teeth. So here you see the, the terahertz spectrum, the silicon nitride, the, the SiO2 fills in between, and then here these are just snapshots of the, of the laser tuning across. Um, this is a little technical. This just shows that we can actually do this important self-referencing step. We can uh, for the experts in the audience, we build phase locks. That means in my mechanical picture that the gears aren't going like this, that they're really stuck together like that, that we've, we're, we've locked them at the optical cycle level. We can do that similarly with this, in this case it was 22 gigahertz, the, the, the narrow space comb that counts the frequency between the terahertz comb teeth and um, 
we can thereby control that terahertz comb spacing relative to about 20 or 30 of these, these 22 gigahertz comb ticks there. And then finally, we can, we can sweep the, the CW laser across them. And that allows us to do things a little bit like I described in that first black box slide, is we can, we can send um, 10 megahertz into this system, a system clock here, so a 10 megahertz quartz oscillator. And at the output, we can program it to give exactly this optical frequency. And this is a series of independent measurements of that optical frequency, and the scatter in those is indicative of, a, of the little bit of residual noise in the, the synthesizer itself, as well as our measurement system. This is a way we characterize that with something called the Allen deviation. But perhaps more interesting is that if we program in a certain frequency, we get exactly the frequency out that we want with an uncertainty of about one and a half optical hertz. So this, this thing really works. We can tune it around, okay? So you say you want, you know, this big number plus or minus a few hundred hertz or a few kilohertz, we can jump it. So there you see it, it's stepping, you know, two to the fifth levels over four megahertz of, of range. And we can make real small steps, 16 hertz shifts here and we can measure and apply those. So this, this truly functions as an optical synthesizer. Now it isn't all in a chip, in one chip package. In fact, if you came in the lab, you know, there's actually three chips kind of spread around, connected by optical fibers and, and some amplifiers and stuff in between them to help uh, overcome losses. But I think it's really significant that we're able to demonstrate for the first time the core pieces that would um, lead to an optical frequency synthesizer on a chip. Okay, so that, that's the, the first part of my talk. In, in the second part, I wanted to, it's going to be quite a switch, but tell you about a different area of research where we are um, synthesizing new colors for spectroscopy, particularly colors in the infrared, okay? So, I had mentioned already that the, the infrared portion of the spectrum had been kind of overlooked, and, and one area that we're quite interested in is this region of 3 to 25 microns. And that's because there's, there's, it's, it's the, the region where you know, the fundamental vibrations of molecules talk to electromagnetic waves. They talk to light there. So people call this a fingerprint region. So being able to accurately create light, generate light, measure, and do spectroscopy with it in this region is powerful for, for many different applications, a few of which I'll talk about in more detail at the end. But let me just point out about three possible ones here. First of all, if, if you want to do atmospheric spectroscopy, which is quite important if you want to understand the chemistry or if you want to understand you know, the, the gases that are trapping heat in our environment, um, it's interesting to look at, these are usually smaller molecules, and all across kind of the, you know, this, this even goes down to the terahertz range into the ultraviolet, but in this range here, 2 to 20 microns, there's all kinds of rich information there. If one wants to look for bad stuff, explosives, this, this would be the transmission, this is PETN, which is a type of ex energetic material or explosive in this range. So if, if you aren't, I had to get, I'm a physicist, I had to get adept with wave numbers. Apologies, but this is, this is kind of like 3 microns to 10 microns here. And you see there's, there's rich spectral information, particularly around 10 microns. Or if you wanted to look at biological materials, and here's spectra of different stuff that's in your body, uh, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, they all have their unique fingerprints in this region. So um, people are quite interested in having accurate diagnostic tools, for example, to try and measure, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's glucose or maybe it's lipids in, in your blood or body fluids. So these are things that could be used not only for, you know, diagnosing your health, but perhaps um, diagnosing whether you're going to get sick at an early stage. So this is, this is quite important and interesting area of the spectrum to do these types, uh, to develop the light sources and do the types of measurements. So how do frequency combs come into this? Well, the, don't, 
I kind of already told you what's on the top of that slide there, but maybe the, the picture that you want to keep in your mind is what's shown on the bottom slide, bottom part of the slide, is that we want to use the comb in this case kind of like a digital sampler where each comb tooth we would know its frequency and, and the amplitude would be well controlled. We would send it through some sample that absorbs out part of the light. In some cases this could be a nonlinear interaction, but let's just think of the linear ones. It's easier that way. And then at the output we would have a simple picture like that where some of the modes are absorbed and you could think of that as being like the fingerprint of the molecule of the compound imprinted on those comb modes. So if we could the, the tricky part is, is, well, there's maybe a few tricky parts, making the comb modes in that portion of the spectrum. This part tends to be pretty easy, just letting the light go through it. But then actually then reading it out is another bit of a challenge. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about creating and about reading out. So for creating the light, one powerful tool that we like to use, and I mentioned earlier that, that Probably the most well-developed lasers on the world exist in this 1.5 micron region of the spectrum. And that's just because there's been billions of dollars poured into that technology from the telecommunications industry. So we like to start with, with erbium-doped fiber uh, lasers that are the basis of our frequency combs. And I won't tell too much about it, but we can, we can go to the blue with that. But then we, we, we use these combs to drive nonlinear processes in different crystals and, and materials to get us out to the infrared. So it's really this, this part that I'll, I'll dwell on the most. Um, but I just wanted to give you one snapshot about, uh, ties back a little bit to the first part of the talk, and that is the use of nanophotonics to, to generate spectra now from, in fact, we can get down to about 300 nanometers and this slide's a little old. Now we're out to near 30 microns. So building off this one platform, very powerful, robust uh, technology starting at 1.5 microns, we can use silicon dioxide, silicon nitride. These are silicon waveguides that give us a very broad wavelength coverage. So I'm going to tell you mostly now about experiments out here where we use materials like gallium phosphide. So the, the basic idea is a very simple one of how we're making light at these long wavelengths is to make broad spectra which correspond in the time domain to short pulses around 1.5 microns. We are using quasi-phase matched nonlinear interactions and because these spectra are so broad we get different components within the same spectrum or inside the same pulse interfering or, or differencing with each other to give light at longer wavelengths. So in the, in, in the frequency domain, we might get a broad spectrum around 10 microns like that. In the time domain, it, it corresponds to a few cycle infrared pulse. I won't say much about this, but it, it's, I like to call this um, few cycle pulses for the masses. We're, in fact, we thought this was a good idea, so we put a, a, applied for a patent on it because it's so, so simple is we take these kind of very robust commercial lasers, we amplify them a little bit, we, we fuse together a few pieces of fiber and a little bit of bulk, you know, silicon dioxide windows, something you can buy for a few hundred bucks, and we can make kind of 10 femtosecond pulses. So this is something that, that I'm pretty excited about because it's such a simple technology, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of kind of the footprint of that. Um, I think it, it could be very robust, could be kind of laptop size. Then if we want to make light in the long wavelength region, we just take some of that short pulse, or we take that short pulse and we put it in material like this. It's an orientation pattern, gallium phosphide. I won't have um, time to explain that to you, but it's a quasi-phase match material, so we solve the problem of, of the phases of the different colors walking off from each other by having engineered into the material a change in the actual semiconductor orientation of the gallium phosphide. And that's not something we do, but a colleague at, at Pete Schunemann does that for us and sends us these, these wonderful crystals that then make spectra that look like this. So in goes 1.5 micron light and out comes light, you know, spanning kind of 4 to 12 microns. And in fact, the, the, as I'll say in a little bit, 
um, we have light beyond this. This, in fact, is where detection that we use cuts off. So one thing that, that was quite interesting to learn in the process of do, uh, studying this source is that actually it's, it's not too far from being a tabletop synchrotron. Okay, so there's the, uh, if you've ever been to Berkeley, go up to the top of the hill, the advanced light source at the Lawrence Berkeley lab. You know, there's a whole building and it's, I don't know, it's synchrotron is 50 or, I don't know, 50 meters across or something like that. Here's our system. You know, you can count the one inch holes and with our, you know, quick and dirty engineering, there's our laser underneath, here's our home built amplifier, here's the few optics on the table, there's the gallium phosphide crystal that makes this spectrum. And what's shown here is, is first of all, it, we, had, we had to go spend a couple weeks in the literature figuring out how synchrotron people describe their intensity. So forgive the weird units, they don't mean anything to me either. But they just allow us to compare. But the, the theoretical limit for the infrared light that would come from a synchrotron is, you know, with reasonable type parameters that would go into something like the ALS is, is this blue line. So everything in reality lies below that. The, the pink curve is what I showed you on the previous slide. The red is our modeling, our simulation. So I think we, we understand pretty well the nonlinear optics that goes into that. The green line is what you would get if you went to Bruker and bought a, a thermal a glow bar, a thermal source for like Fourier transform spectroscopy, which is a dominant technology in this region. So we in fact think that, that we can push our power up by a factor of 10, so over that region. And it's not just that the power is high, it's the, the combination of the power and the bandwidth that makes that very unique. Because people can of course get high power at specific wavelengths, say with a QCL. But even with QCLs, you can't in a single device capture all that bandwidth. So we think that's, a, that's pretty unique. I, so that's the generation side. I told you the other tricky part is the readout. So we can make the light, and what I've shown you are these spectral envelopes, but you have to realize that underneath that spectral envelope is a gazillion little comb teeth, okay? So how are we going to get the information out from that the, the molecule imprints on those comb teeth? We use a technique to do that. It's called dual comb spectroscopy. And this is kind of an... Uh, analog of Fourier transform spectroscopy, but with no moving parts, and in fact, as the name implies, it uses a second comb. So in the frequency domain, what we do is we make an optical frequency comb, say the red one there, and then we make a second one, the blue one, where the spacing of the teeth is slightly different, so that at each optical frequency, we get a heterodyne between pairs of teeth, and each of those heterodyne uniquely maps to the RF domain. So we have a one-to-one -one mapping between heterodyne in the optical domain and RF frequencies, okay? So that's a really powerful and easy way to map the optical information down to the microwave. In the time domain, it, it corresponds to the pulses from these two lasers kind of walking across each other and interfering with each other because the pulses are coming out at different repetition rates. So it's, it's almost like an optical sampling of a stroboscopic sampling of one pulse train with the other. That's implemented, you know, something like this. We make a couple of these systems. We combine them. We might send them through a sample. We can take light out one port of the beam splitter. We can use that as a reference. We can have a sample cell and go to another detector. And this MCT is a mercury cadmium telluride detector. And usually the ones we use are cryogenically cooled. These are what the data look like. So we get these in the time domain. This is data for methanol. We get these interferograms. So this is where it looks like Fourier transform spectroscopy. And we get beautiful signals. In fact, you, the, the real information is in all of these interesting revivals. And the data, it looks like fuzz, but it's real signal stretching out in the time domain here. And th this inset here just shows the repetitive sampling of the pulses as one crosses through the other. And this happens in 20 milliseconds. If that were a Fourier transform spectrometer, that would correspond to moving a mirror in one arm of the Fourier transform spectrometer by about um, three meters or one and a half meters one way in 20 milliseconds. So it's a, it's a much, much faster approach to doing 
this type of spectroscopy than actually mechanically scanning a mirror. Once you get a signal like that, you Fourier transform it, and these are the type of, of spectra we can recover where we compare with kind of standard databases, and we have resolution down to the single comb tooth, so 100 megahertz in this case, and that's the blue dots, and the red is, is the model for methanol in that case. I have one video to show kind of the, the real-time aspects of this. So what you're looking at here is the Fourier transform being performed real-time in the lab. Zoom down, show a little hardware. You, you know, with an iPhone, you can do everything. This is Abhijit Kaligi, one of the postdocs in the duster can, which what, it's supposed to be clean, dry air. It actually has this compound trifluoroethane inside it. And he's just going to spray a little bit of it into the beam. And so you see immediately, this is, this is the... the 10 micron spectrum, he sprays a little bit more, and you can see, you know, we can detect that very rapidly and easily in real time. So that's, that's, a, that's actually a greenhouse, it's, I don't know if it's technically a greenhouse gas, but it's, it traps heat, so it's a, it's a global warming agent. So one problem I had mentioned is, or one, one issue I would mentioned is actually we, we we use these kind of detectors, mercury, cadmium, and telluride. They're, they're nice detectors, but they don't detect very well, particularly for high speeds out beyond 12 microns. In fact, ours even cuts off. This is kind of a generous curve here. The other problem is it, it requires that you fill it up every six hours with liquid nitrogen. And okay, in the lab, that, that's not a problem, but if we wanted to envision using such tools, you know, in a more uh, outside the lab or in some sort of a, you know, trace gas sampling out in the, in the open space, or if you wanted to really have it be an instrument, right, to do real spectroscopy like a Fourier transform instrument in an analytic lab, maybe you don't want to be filling up the, the liquid nitrogen all the time. So we've set out to, to solve this IR detector problem by converting our signals from the infrared domain back into the telecom band. And this can be called in different ways. Um, maybe you want to talk about it as direct sampling of the IR field. Sometimes we call that electro-optic sampling. But here's, here's the basic idea I try to explain, is that remember we make these, we start by taking 1.5 micron light, shining it into this crystal. Intrapulse difference frequency generation makes 10 micron light. So that's, that's the red squiggles here, the electric field of the 10 micron light. Now we still have 1.5 micron light. In fact, we, we make it in another laser again. So we have another short 1.5 micron light. It's about 10 femtoseconds. And we use that and we scan it across here to sample the electric field. Okay, so this is actually a direct electric field measurement. And if we do this with two lasers running at slightly different repetition rates, then this 10 femtosecond pulse with each subsequent pulse, it advances with respect to the IR field, and we can digitally sample it. In the experiment, it looks something like this. We, we make an infrared comb, as I described, or a mid-IR comb, as I described in, in one uh, previous slides. And then we overlap it with this another laser that's making just these 10 femtosecond pulses. And that overlap is done in another nonlinear material, gallium solenoid. And we do some balance detection. And here is our... our Measurement, okay, so not only did we synthesize a 10 micron field, but then we directly measured the electric field at 10 microns. And so this is a, the oscillations here about the 30 femtosecond cycle of that 10 micron light. And since, since this is the electric field, all we got to do is take a Fourier transform and we get the spectrum. And so now you see in this case we don't have any problem with broadband detection. In fact, the detection here is done with in-gas detectors. And so we can get spectral coverage all the way from 4 microns, in this case, out to about 25. So if we had our previous case, we would have lost half the spectrum. So that, that's something, and, and you know, this has been going now just for a month. We're very excited about that because we think it opens up a lot of opportunities for this technology and more kind of real-world applications. Some of those that we're interested in and we're pursuing with... Um, some different colleagues. One of them is with Marcus Rashke, who's a professor at the University of Colorado, is to do near-field 
uh, nanoscopy. And the idea there is that you would take a, um, something that looks like an AFM tip, bring it down near a surface where your sample is. Maybe in, in one case, your sample might be biomolecules. You know, in other cases, it could be you know, 2D materials that people want to study. It could be polymers. This is the example that's shown here. When you bring the tip down and then you illuminate with the 10 micron light, you get a little bit of, of scattered light coming off. You collect that scattered light and do this electro-optic sampling. The scattered light contains a signature, the fingerprint of what's right underneath the tip, okay? And by scanning the tip, you get spatial resolution. In fact, the resolution is determined by the size of that tip, about 10 nanometers. So with 10 micron light, you can still get 10 nanometer resolution. So it's, it's diffraction unlimited imaging, okay? And then via the Fourier transform, you get kind of spectral slicing. So at each point, you can see what's the stuff there and what's its spectral fingerprint. So this is something we're, we're just getting going. We're pretty excited about that. You know, but other directions that we think it could be useful for is kind of rapid chemical synthesis screening. You know, if you're making, you know, drugs, you know, good or bad, okay, so let's assume the good kind. You're making drugs and, and you want to be able to tell they're coming off the factory line. You want to be able to look at them and say, okay, yes, everything, the synthesis proce process is working. It's, it's the aspirin is coming out like we think it should. You could track this stuff in real time. Um, Biomedical applications, I think it's, you know, I'd already hinted at this, early disease detection. We're working with Tom Allison, who's at, at Stony Brook on infrared combs for, for ultrafast dynamics and chemistry. He's a physical chemist. And, you know, maybe even IR spectroscopy on a chip. So, so maybe if we really want to dream about the future, you know, some of the parts that I told you about in the early part of the talk, these chip scale devices, maybe we could get those working in the infrared and one could really have, you know, powerful chemical sensors um, on a chip that you could use for a wide range of applications. So I think with that, I will stop. I just summarize quickly. You know, I told you a little bit about microresonators and how they provide a route to optical frequency th synthesis on a chip. There's really some rich nonlinear optics. I went through it very quickly in two slides and that's been really fun to learn about over the past couple years. Um, we've been able to demonstrate the first synthesis with these chip scale components and a fully integrated synthesizer now seems within reach. I got my pictures mixed up, so, so here's, here's all this stuff describing that. I couldn't even get my numbers straight. But anyway, I also told you about mature erbium fiber technology in nonlinear optics, it's allowing us to do this, this fingerprinting, these measurements in the infrared. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting applications, maybe even lab on a chip, and certainly this near field microscopy that we're very use, interested in. You know, and it's, it's perhaps we could be optimistic. It's opening up a possibility for wide ranging applications, you know, that you could do in the lab or on a research bench somewhere that, you know, your other option would be to get in the queue at the ALS at Lawrence Berkeley Lab if you want to do the experiment there. So I think that's pretty exciting. I'd like to thank the people who work with me at NIST. At NIST, you know, it's we, our, our structure is that we work in a group. I'm a group leader, but it's not like a university professor PI. There's other very qualified and capable staff members who work with me, and particularly want to point out Scott Papp, who, who has been a uh, driving force in, in a lot of the microresonator comb work. Um, and a great group of postdocs, the ones in blue worked on the microresonator comb stuff, the ones in red on the IR and, and students, Alex Lind and Jordan Stone. So, of course, and thanks to the people who pay for all this. And thank you for the invitation again and for your attention.